This is Mommying While Muslim, recorded live and unedited. Watch as Zeba and Uzma record their podcast. See their reactions and find out for yourself what all the buzz is about. This episode is brought to you by Guidance Residential, whose fall refinance special is finally here. Not only can you unlock a lower rate to save thousands of dollars over the course of your contract to own your home sooner, you can also receive $500 towards your appraisal fee. Visit Guidance Residential on Facebook or at Guidance Residential on Instagram today. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Momming While well Muslim podcast. This is Uzma Jafri. And this is Zeba Hassan, and I want to know where in the world is Dr. Osma Joffrey today? Like, I keep singing that Car- Carmen Sandiego song, because every time I look on your Facebook, I'm like, she's somewhere else this week. What are you up to, miss? <laughs> yes, every time you're checking on Facebook, I appear to be traveling, which is true. It was not intended. I went on a girl's trip last week, and that's what we talked about last week, I think, on our soapbox, that women and mothers in particular should take more girl's trips. Um, And now I happen to be on East Coast and sharing the time zone with you, and I'm happy to do it. Uh, It was a random trip to Boston, um, just because we realized life is really short, and uh, my kid's grandfather is over here, and my husband just was like, I have some days off. Let's go. And we'll see the fall colors. So we're here and it will be our first experience apple picking. Oh my goodness. It's, you're going to have a ball because that's one of my kids' favorite things to do. Um, and yeah. make sure you get the honey crisp apples. Those are the best. Okay. I've only bought them from the store. I've never picked them off the tree. So now I'm oh, really excited. Oh, they're so good. Yeah, they're super, super <laughs> exciting. Awesome. Tell me uh, what your plans are for this weekend. Well, you know, my kids are, that's it. Honestly, I spend my weekends going from place to place to place. My calendar is filled with their colors because, you know, each of my kids have their own color. Um, And sadly, I'm not doing anything as exciting and fun as Girls Trip, but I definitely will. um, I won't be able to do Audacity Ozma because now I'm on the phone and my computer is set up somewhere different so I just got because I can't respond to you on text because I'm using my phone Um, but it's just one of those it's literally one of those things where you know they have basketball baseball football is ending so that is pretty much what I'm going to be doing this um, weekend it's not fun and exciting but it's definitely how I like enjoy my weekends Um, and I know you're you're traveling you're with your father-in-law And how has that been? Because I heard he even got your coffee and everything set up for you, which was such a kind gesture. So sweet. Like I went ahead and I ordered my groceries ahead of time, including my coffee and my creamer. And I forgot my syrup. He remembered it and had it ready for me. So it's just really, really sweet. I appreciate, you know, that kind gesture and like all the snacks that my kids eat, including the ones that I don't allow, but he's grandpa. So he's allowed to give it to them. I know. It's okay. He gets a pass because he got my coffee right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're like, I'm going to make, I'm going to make this work. But you know, this is the thing that I wanted to ask you guys, like what, it, what do you think our soapbox for this week is? Because I have a feeling it's going to be quite interesting because we've had a couple of things happen, unfortunately this week. So I'd yeah. like to hear your perspective and let's see where this goes. So again, we have news out of Texas. It is my home state. I still do love it, but man, am I shaking my head at my home state an awful lot these days. So again in Texas. SMDH. SMDH, yeah. So um, a man in Texas apparently at 3 in the morning was pulled into the driveway of somebody's home with his windows rolled up, with his phone in his hand, and he was shot shot twice by the homeowner, um, shot dead. And this happened on October 11th in a small town out of Texas, 40 miles outside of Austin. And it's very sad because this man immigrated some time ago from Morocco. Uh, His name is Adel, and I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, Douri. He was 31 years old, and he had uh, just left his girlfriends nearby. And she's very sure after looking at the crime scene that his windows were rolled up and he is reportedly 
per her and all of his friends and colleagues and co-workers, a really simple nice guy who used to like driving in the long roads of Texas just to clear his head, but maybe he had gotten lost and had his phone in his hand and was potentially looking, we think, for directions. Initially, the homeowner uh, was charged for shooting somebody and released in less than 24 hours because in Texas, we Mm -hmm. have... I used to think as a child it was good to ask questions later. Yeah. Now that I know later, how Islam yeah. is practiced, you give people several excuses before you shoot them dead. Maybe talk to them. So it is a uh, self-defense, is a get-out-of-jail-free card typically used for white people. We have... Um, that's the same law that people used when they killed Ahmad Aubrey. Remember the man that they stalked and then shot? Mm-hmm. Those three gentlemen did. Um, so it yes. happens uh, to protect white men who are protecting themselves. But I believe in only 3% of cases, it was okay for a black man to shoot himself, in, uh, to shoot a white man in self defense. So it inordinately oh, protects this self defense. Um, clause inordinately protects white people and inordinately leaves people of color without any uh, justice, really. So the family of the victim is in Morocco and there's a lot of money being sent over there for the family because now his body has to be transported over there. Technically, that is not, for those of our non-Muslim audience members, technically that's not how we practice our funeral rites. He would be buried in the place that he died within 24 hours of his death. Obviously, there's, you know, an autopsy happening and all kinds of stuff that's extending that uh, Islamic requirement. But the family has requested his body be shipped over. And any extra money that they are, they're getting, because it's above and beyond um, the transportation costs, they are hiring a private investigator to get justice for their son because he really was just starting his life. He'd gotten a degree out here um, and had a, uh, had a job um, as an Uber driver as he was looking for other um, uh, uh, jobs in his industry, which was finance. So it's a real shame. Uh, Care Texas is on it, and they're calling it right now a shame, but I hope that they uh, push the, uh, I think it's Martindale, police department and uh, to press charges of murder because until we set a precedent we're just not going to get justice for people of color particularly men of color in this country sadly so we need to do a better job stepping up for our people of color and especially our Muslim brothers and sisters who are inordinately being targeted in certain states uh, mine included. So uh, I am super duper excited to continue our um, Uh, disability awareness series this month in October and we are honored today to have on Andalib Alayan. She is executive director of Global Deaf Muslim. She and her team address the rights and needs of deaf Muslims. They are trying to um, make Islam in particular more accessible and inclusive of deaf Muslims. She knows how important this resource is because Andalib herself is deaf. For our podcast audience who's only on audio right now, please be mindful that the voice you hear is that of an interpreter as Undalib speaks ASL. If you want to see Undalib, our speaker, you can visit our YouTube channel, Momming While Muslim. We thank Cheryl for her interpretive services today, but let's remember that Undalib has her own voice and she speaks for herself. Welcome Undalib to the podcast. Salam alaikum. Thanks for joining us. Thank you also for having me. We were really excited to find out about Global Deaf Muslim. And uh, typically we kick off, before we get into that, we like to kick off by asking our guests to, um, especially the ones who are not moms yet, tell us about your mother, her mommying philosophy, and how that affects your work today. Sure. My mom. So my mother, her philosophy, I feel like it was really to encourage her children to be strong, make sure I stood up for myself, 
And she also made sure to empower me to make decisions for myself. And how do I say, she's just a very, very supportive and I really appreciate my mother for that and I'm blessed to have my mom. She also made sure that I had a good, strong education. And I mean, I could go on and on about my mom like we all could, right? But she was really, really wonderful in those ways. I love that, subhanAllah. May Allah reward her and increase her. So on that note, uh, yeah, we can see you now. So on that note, we're going to kind of um, bounce off of that and ask you about your um, family of origin, whatever you're comfortable sharing with us on Dalip. So I was born in Palestine. So my family is all from Palestine. I was born deaf at the time and my family member, no other family members had been deaf. And so of course, um, you know, my mother didn't know what to do. She was very shocked because she didn't expect to have a deaf child. And the way she realized that something was different is because I was not meeting the speaking milestones. I wasn't speaking at the ages, age appropriate times. So she took me in for a hearing test, actually multiple hearing tests. And then they realized that yes, um, I had hearing loss, I was deaf. And of course for a parent that's, you know, very earth shattering, uh, very emotional for her. I mean, that's a very normal thing for a mother to find something, you know, that extraordinary about their child. And so my family moved to the United States. I was just a baby at that time. But then my family decided to move back to Palestine. But as I was growing up over there, and also I should let you know, I have a, a deaf younger sister. She was born in America. So at the time we were back to, to Palestine and they have, my parents had these two deaf daughters. They realized that in Palestine, it was going to be a little bit difficult to raise deaf children. There wasn't a lot of accessibility. Um, if there was a school for deaf children it was far away, we would have to live in the dorms. And so at that point, my family moved back to America because there were good, you know, employment opportunities and educational opportunities for both myself and my sister to have, you know, access to schooling and lots of different good programs for the deaf and things like that. So that's my family background. Um, also, um, just a little bit about myself. I'm a full-time accountant. I graduated from Gallaudet University, which is a university in Washington, DC, that is for deaf students. However, my sister who's deaf did not go to Gallaudet. She went to George Mason University in the area here and she studied graphic design. And so that's who we are right now. No, thank you for sharing that. That's an incredible story. And I think a lot of uh, Muslim American moms who are having kids stateside, you know, it just goes to show all of those annoying things that are happening in the hospital in the first 24 hours, there's good reason for it, right? Because you weren't diagnosed until the speaking milestones had to be made probably like an hour, sorry, a year after the fact when children are expected to speak. Here in America, when a child is born within the first 48 hours, we do an audiology test on the newborn and that's how we can detect early um, early hearing loss or hearing impairment and make interventions at that time. Um, yeah, and so I don't know when they started that hearing test for babies. I know it is, like you said, required now, but I think even back then, I'm not sure if it was required back when my sister and I were in the U.S. Oh, okay. I, I'm a baby of the 70s, so I know it wasn't done during that time either, but I had an uncle who walked into the room, and he would clap really hard, and I would startle, and he was like, oh, she's not deaf. So that's how 
he did it because he saw it being done back home when the midwives used to deliver babies at home. So he's like, this is how you test hearing. So I don't know if that was done in Palestine. I'm sure our moms over there and our foremothers in Palestine had ways of checking that as well. But I'm glad that you got the attention and the care that you needed. Um, I am interested to know if when you your family came back to the States, given that your sister is also deaf, was there any genetic testing done, if you're comfortable sharing that at all with us? And when she said my interpreter froze a little bit. So we didn't do that genetic testing at all. It's very expensive. And so we were wondering you know, is there deaf family members in our history of generations or were we the first? We haven't found that answer. Um, you know, maybe we could do something like that. We would just kind of maybe wanting to know how we became deaf. But right now it's just more of a, a small curiosity for us. So we didn't do that. Maybe, like I said, there's someone in our, you know, past. But even as it went down the generations, nobody shared that information. So we don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, that's just interesting. I'm just curious to know because um, uh, just having seen patients that are deaf or have hearing impairment, it's like, you know, those are questions that we ask. So force of habit, I apologize. <laughs> um, I'm uh, going to ask you straight away. Um, because you are the executive director to tell us about Global Deaf Muslim, what does it do and what services and resources does it provide for deaf Muslims? Sure. Global Deaf Muslim was founded to make Islam accessible, accessible for deaf Muslims and how we define that accessibility many different ways, but we have classes Islamic classes, we were getting together, but you know, now they're online because of COVID. So we have Zoom meetings. Those are for both youth groups and adult groups. And we also do provide interpreters when there are guest lectures somewhere speaking on Islam or to the Muslim community. We just have many different activities. We have social events. Um, Global Deaf Muslim is kind of like a family for Deaf Muslims because Deaf Muslims can come in and feel at home. Maybe they're stuck, isolated in their house and we can all get together and, you know, um, be sharing the same language and meet when we get to meet person to person again. Uh, we also have ASL classes for non-deaf Muslims who want to learn sign language to communicate with deaf Muslims. And the reason I'm really proud of GDM is because we are run by deaf Muslims. So we're for and of deaf Muslims. And that's a really empowering thing for all the people who are involved. And also, we also do um, collect donations and provide support for deaf Muslims in need to make sure that nobody's marginalized or left out of the community because of need. That's absolutely fascinating because honestly, I never even saw any um, interpretive services for Muslims in the masjid until I, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a masjid in Dallas. I, I always forget which one Omar, Sheikh Omar Suleiman is imam at, but you know, you see the little, the screen on the virtual services during COVID last year and we finally got to see um, interpret, uh, interpret, interpreters there um, for ASL. And it was like, oh yeah, how do deaf Muslims listen to the khutbah? <laughs> I was so surprised. So tell me what you're using right now. Is it the services provided, the interpretive services provided by Global Deaf Muslims that um, communities are using right now uh, to hear the khutbah and to hear Islamic lectures? Or are there other things that preceded maybe Global Deaf Muslims? <clears throat> I 
I don't think there was a whole lot happening before GDM in terms of accessibility. People really didn't know about deaf Muslims. We really had to make ourselves known and check in at the masjids because people didn't realize what was needed. And honestly, that's the way it is. Deaf people have to ask others to be aware. And then we have to kind of go in and talk about, you know, people say, well, can we afford interpreters? And then they say, well, you know, how do we set these things up? And it could be <clears throat> interpreters in person or via, you know, video. And all of that is not an easy process. So we do also at GDM, we've set up a network of interpreters, but then you have the other problem that interpreters don't know a whole lot about Islam and maybe some of them are nervous to come into a Muslim environment. So we do have a few select interpreters that, you know, in the past we've tried to provide workshops for people to teach interpreters literally just the vocabulary that they need if in, in English or Arabic words and then in sign language as well. So there's a whole lot involved in the process. Yeah, that sounds incredible. It almost sounds like you need more Muslim ASL interpreters. Yes, we do. We do. We always need more of those. Does um, GDM offer any training besides the ASL classes that I saw on, um, I think on your social media, are starting on Sunday for non-ASL um, folks? Is there any other training that you offer? Because it can't just be classes to become an interpreter. There must be some additional training that they have to undergo. Like I said, we do provide those workshops <clears throat> for interpreters, but interpreters need their certifications and things like that. Um, and mostly for us, it's been at the level of explaining the vocabulary and you know, explaining what these different Arabic and Muslim terms mean and how they're used. And so in that way, if um, Muslims aren't becoming, you know, sign language interpreters, we'll have a referral pool of interpreters to put in place. Yeah. I'm making a plug to our audience because um, Zeba's daughter is also learning ASL as a second language. And I think it's just an opportunity for all of our kids to get trained and, and do it because who knows like when we might need it as well. So it's a really nominal cost, um, at least what I saw Global Deaf Muslim offering. What was it, something like $35 for the level one or the level two ASL? So please go sign up. Um, I've never seen ASL classes uh, that uh, cost friendly. so please go ahead and do that. Um, I'm, I'll be signing up my kids and myself, so I'm excited about that. Oh, that's wonderful. Very excited to see you there and have you join that. Inshallah. Um, and, so um, we do really try to keep it low cost to get people in because we know that that's one of the barriers for people in the whole situation too. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned earlier about um, the cost, I think, to the masjid for having ASL interpreters and maybe even closed captioned, uh, closed captioned services. What do you know, like how much of an investment uh, in dollar amounts a masjid would have to make in order to have regularly scheduled um, at least once a week Friday um, interpret uh, interpreter services or closed captioning? Yes, um, if they have deaf Muslims in the area, you need to make sure that you have deaf Muslims in the area and you know that they're wanting to come in. Uh, for an hour of interpreting for the hutbah and stuff, um, I would say it by six, it'd be $65, you know, you can maybe negotiate. You have both agency interpreters and freelance interpreters. Freelance interpreters work for a little less because there's no overhead, and then you would have to decide how long you want them, you know, on a Friday. And sometimes masjids will set it up for just once a month or each week. But then there are also, you know, classes and things that you want, or you're just talking, I'm sorry, about agencies again. You can um, work with different agencies to look at different pricing and stuff. So that that's kind of the approach from the money perspective. And also, 
The thing is, if a lecture or something goes on for two hours, that's there, there's also like a two hour minimum and there's a cost to have more than one interpreter if it's a lengthy event. So there's a lot of intricacies in the whole money thing, but that's kind of what it looks like. Yeah. I've been to an event where, you know, it was like an all day event and they had multiple interpreters and they would be up for, you know, I think I, I didn't time it exactly, but it was something like 20 minutes and then they would switch out and keep rotating. And I was so confused why that was happening. And then I realized the effort that the interpreter has to put it, physical effort it takes to um, sign. And so for that reason, they were, you know, switching out so that they could last all day for eight hours. Yeah, um, that's true. And it is kind of maybe exhausting for signing, but basically the idea is that the interpreter is always paying attention too. And yeah. so that's coming through their brain, one language into another, and you want to take, they want to take care of their health and you want them to take care of their health so they can interpret. And so that's why they do switch out. Yeah, wonderful. And is there any state that provides these interpretive services for free? Because, I mean, I would think that the Disability Act would require um, states to comply with providing these kinds of services, or is it because they're particularly religious services that they would not? That's a good point. ADA doesn't apply to religious environments. It's more for businesses, you know, corporations, organizations. And so with the religious events, it isn't always that way. So sometimes that's a way for people to avoid offering accessibility and why we have to ask for interpreters. We don't want to force people, but sometimes we have to force people. And honestly, deaf Muslims need to participate and be able to learn. And so I have the situation where we've met deaf adults who know nothing about the religion, know nothing about Islam or just the very basics because they haven't had accessibility to either the masjid or their parents who are hearing and don't know sign language. And so didn't even communicate religious stories and things to them growing up. And so it's so important for deaf Muslims at whatever age to get the information about their religion, about Islam. Yeah, that to me is just mind blowing when I first visited uh, GDM's website and was like, oh, I didn't even think about this. I was just focusing on khutbahs and how do you hear the khutbah or how do you hear Quran being recited um, or, you know, spoken. And then it was Islamic classes, of course. There's very few Islamic classes where I've seen um, ASL uh, being offered. And that probably was within the last five years, to be really honest. So right before COVID. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Yeah. And one thing that is sort of common is cultural perspectives about deafness and about disability. People think that, oh, if you're deaf, well, then you, we don't have to worry about them going to Islamic classes. Um, you know, they get a pass on some of those things. So because the person, you know, can't hear, there's no way and people decide we don't really have to make an effort. So they kind of excuse themselves and give a, try to give a pass to the person with a disability instead of actually getting them engaged in the Islamic education. But it also depends a lot on the parents. Um, what efforts do they do? Like I said, you know, about my parents, Alhamdulillah, um, they were very good about teaching me Islam, teaching me how to pray. And, you know, saying, of course, a deaf person can pray, even if we're not voicing it or speaking it, the prayer is in our heads. Um, and so some people honestly think deaf people can't pray. And it's, it's just a mindset in that way. Of course, deaf people have a connection to God without the spoken word. That we had a speaker on earlier this month, um, Sarah Minkara from uh, ETI, Empowerment Through Integration, and she was uh, teaching us actually about how in Islam we have that charity narrative and we you're talking about the cultural approach to people with disabilities and it's like, oh, they're miskeen, so that I think it's like they get a pass on everything. Um, but just because you have a disability doesn't mean that you a don't have a desire and b don't have the ability to learn and to perform and to do everything that's important to you including the practice of your religion and for that reason the charity narrative has to be replaced with the empowerment um, narrative and to let people tell you what they need so when a deaf muslim is coming to you at the masjid and saying we need interpretive services 
doesn't matter for what reason, get the services. Contact, I assume, GDM in order to get the referral for approved um, interpreters, yes? Yeah, that's exactly right. <clears throat> that's a very good point uh, about the charity perspective. I hadn't actually thought of that, but yes, wow. Well. Yeah, it was very new for me too. So I was like, Phew. I'm learning so much this month, alhamdulillah. That's why I love our series because our, our speakers teach us so, so much, um, including yourself. So given that, you know, Islam is not a monolith and people are coming from all over the world um, to America and they're in our masajid, speaking all these different languages, does ASL change from language to language? Like, would we have to have, is Arabic ASL different than, say, like Somali ASL? And if so, would we have to provide interpreters in those, accord, you know, in those languages accordingly? So yes, different countries have their own sign language. ASL is different than you know any of the countries you've mentioned, UK and the US, their sign languages don't look alike. And so of course you have the international perspective, but we also have something in sign language that's called like international sign language, just do know kind of thing. And so an interpreter from, you know, who are from other countries as well can come in and kind of make the language accessible. So um, I know an interpreter from Jordan who can interpret in Arabic and so if they notice, if an interpreter notices that the deaf people are having a struggle with the language and the communication, then they can sort of match what people need and maybe use a little more gestures, not necessarily a language, but add some gesture and things until people are ready from another country to pick up the ASL, not that they're here. So that explains the facial expressions that sometimes accompany interpretive services. Yeah, um, facial expressions are very important in um, deaf culture in general. And there are specific facial expressions related to the grammar. But we also have other things in, in um, deaf culture that hearing people maybe don't know about. The way that you get the attention of a deaf person, come up behind them and gently tap them, you know. Um, hearing people kind of feel like, oh, you know, I'm not going to touch somebody. If there's a deaf person, I don't want to touch them. But, I mean, that's culturally appropriate in, in groups in a way of getting attention. And that's um, how, you know, the community is set up and how we get along. Okay. That's how it is in the deaf community. That's good to know. Um, and it sounds like there's almost an international standard ASL and that the interpreters, maybe if they're specially trained, can go country to country and communicate with all people. Did I understand that correctly? Or is it more, you know, Arabic itself has so many dialects and there are within Arabic ASL dialects with your hands that you can communicate? That's um, very interesting. Yes, Arabic does have a lot of dialects, of course, but in terms of like an international conference, we would probably have Arabic interpreters and then uh, just, you know, international sign interpreters or interpreters from the different countries where the, you know, groups of deaf people are coming from. Um, I'm thinking if you just think about like a person who's hearing can understand an Arabic spoken Arabic, but a German person wouldn't understand that. So it's just the idea of, you know, the different languages, the different sign languages, and trying to get the communication out through interpreters. I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole thing from a visual language, same as like spoken languages have that, yeah. you know. I understand that much better. Thank you. Um, I'm only thinking because my masjid is so international, we would probably need three or four ASL interpreters, even if it was just for like, you know, an hour halaqa or something in order to explain to all of our different communities, you know, in terms that they can understand um, and include them and make the, the halaqa accessible to them. So thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, this is a question that I know Zeba would be um, very interested in uh, just because we're always about let, let's empower moms and let's get them ready, 
All right. So what are your top five tips to a Muslim mom to help her, to guide her, to help her child if and when that child is diagnosed with deafness? Sure. Okay. The number one, I'm going to say breathe. Breathe. Don't panic if you have a deaf baby. Be happy you have a healthy baby. And really just know that your baby can do anything except here. So, you know, they can do whatever they want, be whatever they want. So breathe. And, and get that in, in your mind and your heart. And then also it'd be important to reach out to different organizations or universities or things to learn about deafness and deaf culture, learn as much as you can. And don't be afraid to reach out to people for that kind of information. Um, let me think. I just forgot what I was gonna say. Take your time. <laughs> Give me one moment to think. Okay, it came back to me. Okay, so communicate with your children. It's very important. Communication is key. Um, don't ignore language because you can. The child will be language deprived. There is plenty of scientific research that talks about intellectual development delays because of language deprivation. You want to make sure that they're developing and have communication and language as a, at an early age. Even with a baby, you can start signing signs to them. Um, and the next step, be sure that you're there for your deaf child. Encourage them to, you know, follow their own dreams. That's what I would say. I think, was that five? I think that was sure. three, but that's good. That's a good jumping uh, jumping point, I think. Um, and I would, I would want to know if a parent, well, first of all, what were your parents, uh, did they know ASL or did they have to go back and learn? And if that, I think that would typically be the case for the general population. If they had a deaf child, they would have to go back and learn ASL. How do you suggest they do that in a stepwise manner? Because all of us kind of learned the baby sign language because that was like the cool thing to do in the early 2000s. And then we didn't carry it on and continue learning to be helpful to any other population just to get our nonverbal children to the point where they were speaking. Um, but where would you point a Muslim mom to to go get those um, ASL skills that she's going to need for the rest of her child's life? Okay, and of course this is different per individual and different experiences. Um, I myself as a deaf person use hearing aids and with my mother, I'm, I'm also having to be very good at lip reading. Not all deaf people are. And I could lip read my mother. She did take some ASL classes because she wanted to communicate, but she did mostly things from online and ASL books back then. Um, the biggest thing with your deaf child is to make sure you're having eye contact with them when you're communicating and do the research to, you know, pick up the language and the deaf culture and also make sure that you're giving them the religious information and teaching them Islam and not, and not forgetting about that as part of this and making sure that they become responsible as well. It's just like um, any other child, you know, deaf or not deaf, <laughs> you, I, I don't, I, I use the word normal, any other normal child, but deaf or not deaf, people with a disability or not, I don't want to be thought of as, oh, I'm deaf, I should be treated a different way, you know, given in a pass on things or whatever. Deafness is part of my identity, but, you know, it's who I am. But I will, you know, make it through the different barriers that I have. And there are different ways, you know, for people to become successful like that. But so parents just have to kind of keep that all in mind about the deaf person as a whole. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And I think the community outside of that family unit with the deaf child also needs to realize that, you know, being deaf, just like being Muslim isn't, well, for me, being Muslim is who all I am, but, you know, like what you do or how you appear to the world or your physical makeup is not who you are. That's not the only thing that defines you. And that, you know, 
if deafness is a barrier for a particular family, okay, what are we going to do to help overcome that barrier so that that child can be everything else that they're destined to be? Because we're all born with God-given gifts and deafness is not an impediment. I think in a lot of cases it probably is a gift as well because you're not hearing all the garbage uh, gossip at the masjid for sure. So. Well, there is that, yes. Um, <clears throat> when I was young and I'm um, growing up, I have this little story for you here. Um, I kind of felt left out. I had a big family and being Middle Eastern and it was frustrating in terms of communication because sometimes I didn't see what people said or I'd ask them, hey, what'd you say? And they'd go, oh, never mind. Oh, I'll tell you later. And it was just a very isolating experience. But as I grew up, um, I accepted my identity as being deaf and I realized that is who I am in my life journey and also in the past like when I was young I'd be afraid to go in up to a cashier at a restaurant and order food because I'm like hard oh, they're not gonna understand me what are they gonna think about me but now like I said it's who I am and I'm happy to type it on my phone and show it to somebody. It's simple communication. I was also very shy and I didn't want people like looking at me because I'm deaf or I'm different. But now, um, you know, I don't care. I'm out in the public and if I'm using sign language and they want to look, whatever. So, I mean, everybody has their own journey as a deaf individual as well. But I do sometimes have things that frustrate or are frustrating to me, but it's not because of my deafness. It's because of how people respond to me as a deaf person. And because maybe they don't understand, how do I say, how to be, you know, how, how to respond, how to interact with me. So it's not necessarily how we as deaf people, you know, have to approach things. It's also how people have to come and meet us, but also, don't, people shouldn't be afraid to meet a deaf person. <laughs> We've got smartphones. My goodness, I can type back and forth to you with today's technology, which is just out of, you know, unbelievable opportunities through technology. We, um, you know, like we've talked about having closed captions. We talked about interpreters and things. I mean, if I think back to former generations of deaf who didn't have that kind of technology, um, really right now there are so many ways that you can communicate. There's no way that it's impossible to provide support at this time. Nothing's impossible. And so many things are easy to bridge that communication gap. And I'm also wondering um, if you, if maybe people are wondering how deaf people use telephones. Mm -hmm. What we have is something called VP. And so I will call in and on a computer screen or a telephone that has a screen, I'll see an interpreter. And then the interpreter will make the phone call and do what just what the interpreter is doing here, watch the deaf person and talk to the hearing person. And we also, if obviously, if two deaf people are uh, wanting to speak with each other, we just have like a, a FaceTime or a video phone that we can um, communicate through sign language directly. Sometimes people say, oh, can deaf people drive? Yes, of course we can. <laughs> um, you know, and we're always open to silly questions like that as well. You can you can approach deaf people and, and they're happy to engage with you yeah I'm not ashamed to admit I was going to ask next how do you drive <laughs> oh that's so funny um, well you know people always say we have really great attention to visual thing and um, you know people talk about deaf people obviously rely on their eyes instead of their ears so if you think about driving it really is about you know paying attention to what's around you people say oh what if there's a siren or a, you know police something how are you gonna know about that or being pulled over or well or, or, or how cars have to get out of the way well we see other cars pulling over for a police siren so we know to pull over as well so and it's also visual to see the siren to see the lights so yeah I've been I've been driving for a while and I've been fine oh also um, I was just going to say another thing about technology in terms of just everyday life. If you come to a deaf person's house and ring the doorbell, they often have it hooked up to the lights so that the lights will flash. And I know someone's at the door. Also for alarm clocks, people who are deaf have alarm clocks that vibrate. They can put on your pillow, put on your mattress. I mean, people really come up with solutions to whatever it is they need in the world. Yeah. And we now have those apps with those um, smart bells, right? So you can get a notification on your phone that your door, there's somebody at your door 
door, the doorbell is ringing and packages arrive. So I, I am like you in awe of the technology we have. And I have so much guilt um, for all the advantages that we were basically handed on a silver platter um, that the generations before us didn't get and they struggled. And, you know, for that reason, I think it's probably why we didn't see a lot of people um, that were blind or deaf growing up. I know they existed. They were there. But because we hadn't had resources and services set up for them like this and we didn't have the technology to communicate with them um, or to engage with them, I think as a result, they probably just withdrew and remained in their own communities, which is just absolutely tragic because we lost all of those opportunities to learn from them. <clears throat> that is so true. Um, specifically, I want to talk about deaf schools back then. Mm-hmm. Oh, schools back then, um, education, there was no, you know, schools for the deaf and deaf students would literally just sit there and have everything just go past them all day. All It was all in spoken words. And like I talked about, I had gone to, I went to a mainstream school, which means it's a general public school, but it has a program for deaf and hard of hearing. So they'll have interpreters in the main classes. And then uh, deaf people have what's called an IEP, which is a, an educational plan for them and how they can get the most of their education. They'll also have maybe some classes where the deaf and hard of hearing students are all together in a room for a class together where there's direct communication. And um, the good thing is that the deaf students can pick up information from them all day, all around them, not just what they're learning in class. Yeah, we had a speaker last week come on and talk about inclusive classrooms. Um, and how the contained classroom for anybody with disabilities and just keeping them separated, isolated from the general population of students is absolutely wrong um, and that they deserve to be integrated with, you know, all the other students, the abled students, because they are still abled, you know, they can still learn and, um, like you said, absorb from they're in all the environments that they're in and to keep them I appreciate that there was you know one class that you experienced with other deaf and hard of hearing students so that you had your own community but also to go out and realize that you have this big community out here too that is abled but you know probably has a lot of other intersections uh, with you and so it was important to interact with them and learn with them um, I guess what I uh, my point is that the inclusivity was so important and that the I'm going to assume that the ASL interpreters that followed you from class to class or were present in your class to interpret for you, those would be covered by the state, right, under the ADA because it's public education. Yes, the school play, paid for the educational interpreters. That's right. And when you're talking about classes in the mainstream, <clears throat> I was in a class that was mixed with hearing students, but I did feel lonely as a deaf student. And it really, it depends on, you know, the level of reading and writing and the background of education a person had. Um, some mainstream classes I remember, I really wanted to be with my deaf friends. And I was just in this class alone with a whole bunch of, you know, people who couldn't communicate with me. Um, and sometimes, I mean, the system of education is very difficult, specifically for deaf students, because oh, <laughs> a little break in the technology there. Okay, um, I'm back. And people who are deaf do need good teachers who are capable of understanding their sign language and making sure they can um, achieve at the correct levels. And ASL is not like English. It has its own grammar. It's a specific language. It does not have the same structure in its sentences and many differences. And so what happens is the deaf people can sometimes get behind when they're in a mainstream class, depend depending on, you know, what their individual experiences are. And so a way to improve the education is to, you know, try to have a separation between, and the church is just gonna check in. And one second for the interpreter to catch up. So, it, it, it's a 
it's a bigger deal for deaf students in school because they're really needing to learn two languages at the same time. They're learning ASL and developing in that, but they're also developing their English. So they're really working on two languages in their studies, whereas the hearing people don't have to do that. If I'm making sense with that, if my interpreter's making sense with that. Yeah. So it sounds a little bit like you're more for a, a contained environment for deaf students in particular. where they're interacting with, you know, their peer, their deaf peers. And, and again, I do want to say, you know, all of this depends um, on how early did the deaf student themselves learn sign. Mm -hmm. Do they have some delays in both their education and their language or maybe, um, you know, intellectual development because of language deficiency or language delay? Um, so it's really sometimes an issue where they're trying to catch people up from remedial reading and writing if they were stuck in that kind of environment where they didn't have the opportunity to even learn it. But like I'm saying again, you have the two languages working in a deaf person as well. And so you're in an educational system and you're having to, tr it, it's, it's, it's very, very, very complicated for deaf, for the educational system dealing with deaf students. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds fair. I understand more about that. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with us? Like say your ideal Mushad experience in Ramadan. Uh, I'm particularly interested in learning how deaf people would attend say Tarawi and um, you know, how do we, how do we overcome that barrier and how do we make and that accessible? Gonna, I'm so sorry, Uzma, the interpreter is going to ask you for that Word. Tarawi, T A R A W E E H. The night prayer in Ramadan. Like, how do we make that more accessible for our deaf brothers and sisters? So, from my own personal experience, which is obviously separate from my organization, Global Deaf Muslim. So um, now with, um, again, technology, when there's Arabic being spoken, you can turn a phone on and it will automatically translate um, because nobody, uh, like interpreters or other people, my family, if I'm going with them, don't know Arabic. So I use a phone for that. But in, in terms of deaf people in general, you're right. They're going to be there and they're not going to get a lot out of it. They'll do their prayers, maybe a little more standing their rote and not, you know, have the same experience. And the mom will say, you know, what to do, and, and you'll follow people. And the interpreter also has to know Arabic. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know Arabic, then, you know, what are you going to do? And maybe on Sunday you have, you know, maybe there's an English translation of what the imam is saying on a screen. And then the interpreter can read from that and turn that into ASL. Um, so it really just depends on the masjid's efforts and what they're going to provide, even in terms of providing the English translation. And if many of their, the Muslims at the masjid are, you know, from Arabic countries, then maybe they aren't even thinking about that English translation. But again, an interpreter is going to be working for the Tuya um, many hours. So you have to have at least two interpreters to switch in and out for that. So it's it's a lot of time and effort to put things together for something like that, for yeah. events like that. I still think it would be worth it. You know, as a hearing person, I, I would want to share that experience with my, um, the, my deaf community because, you know, it's just, you know, Ramadan is our favorite time of the year. And you want to give that to non-Muslims too and give that sense and that feeling to them. Why would we withhold it from our um, Muslim brothers and sisters? And I really do urge anybody, if you know that you have um, out in the audience there, if there is anybody deaf in your masjid family, please start working with your masjid to provide these kinds of resources and services that Andalib is describing. Because there's many alternatives. Like she said, technology is our 
friend, unless it's, you know, actually surveying Muslims like it has done in the past. But technology is typically our friend and uh, can help us overcome those barriers and share these experiences and especially the spiritual experience of Islam, which is, I think, of utmost importance with our deaf community and our deaf children going forward. And I think that that is really critical. That's why Zeba and I do this podcast to make sure that, you know, our children are raised strong in Islam and maintain Islam if they don't keep anything else keep your religion maintain your religion no matter what barriers you have and no matter what challenges you have to overcome and i'm so grateful that you came on and talked to us about global deaf muslims today do you have any final thoughts or any final pieces of advice um, for those in the hearing com- hearing muslim community uh, things that we can do better or you know where we should go first if we want to say volunteer to help um, deaf muslims where can we where can we start Um, So, for example, like during Ramadan, there tends to be lots and lots of lectures. So getting captions set up for that, for captioning videos um, that are put together, it's really hard to try and lip read that kind of stuff. And if you can hire a captioner or they have like YouTube has automatic captions for videos, if things are videoed from the voice, you can go in and edit it because it's not always the best, but you can just make those edits. If you can, you know, if you want to put in trim or replace, contact GDM because we have the pool of that. And with Ramadan and the deaf Muslim community, they are eager to learn. And during Ramadan, GDM does have, you know, our iftars, a community iftar, within GDM, that is one of our favorite times. Um, but so deaf Muslims do want to, you know, learn about what's going on in the religion. And so if closed captions can be added, even to just videos, um, just keep in mind that people with disabilities, it, you make it a habit to have accessible communication, accessible information. Just make it your habit that there are people with disabilities that need accessibility. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. Um, as I spoke about our uh, the charity narrative, the guest who taught us about charity narrative, um, we're not doing a favor to any of our disabled brothers and sisters by providing the services that they need in order to worship. Like that's almost a fard on us. It's a requirement on us as Muslims to provide opportunities, not opportunities, the right to learn um, just the deen. You know, like, let's not even talk about, like, secular education, the Islamic education, which is already so hard for hearing people. Think about how much harder it is for somebody who cannot. Yes, and I want to say that I appreciate you giving myself and GDM the voice today to share our experiences and our perspective and opinions on what we've seen going on. Um, We feel like people can learn from us and they have to remember that deaf people need to be given empowerment and you need to ask us and let us tell you what we need, not make decisions for us. And you can see sometimes that um, there are different organizations set up that maybe want to make decisions for deaf people, for people with disability. But the idea is that the people who are needing or wanting accessibility need to be telling people what they want and what they need. 100%, 100%. And the only addendum that I'll make to what the beautiful words that you just um, shared with us is that we don't give a voice to anybody on this um, podcast. This is a platform where we offer the mic because you have your own voice. You are already a strong, perfect and complete person. Everybody who comes to this podcast is and we we have so much to learn from you and from your voice. And it doesn't matter if Um, we can hear it or not, it's there and it's very palpable. Like you have a presence that is perfect and beautiful and powerful and we really appreciate you sharing that with us, you and all our other guests. Thank you so much. And it was really nice to meet you as well. Absolutely. So we'd like to wrap up to let our audience get to know you a little bit better with something called a rapid fire. 
it sounds scarier than it is, but basically in one minute, you're going to answer some simple, simple questions. There's no wrong answer. First thing that pops into your mind, just tell us what it is. So um, I already feel like my, I have an uh, intellectual breakdown happening here, but go ahead. No, no, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost, yeah, that time of day when we need that last cup of coffee. I understand. So I'm going to go ahead and start the timer for one minute. And where did this go? Tell me, um, what's the first career you dreamed of as a kid? Hmm. I think I wanted to be a dentist. Oh, okay. Yeah, I never got into cleaning people's teeth. I ended up marrying somebody who does, so it's okay. Um, if someone was going to play you in a movie, an actor or actress that you know, who would it be? Ha. I don't know if they have a deaf Muslim actress out there to play me. Well, then you would have to just play yourself. <laughs> yeah, I think that I was saying that. A new right. career I to, for you. <laughs> I was saying that at the same time. I'll have to be myself. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh. Huh. You can't please everyone, I think. You know, everything, when things are going on and that's the one that comes to mind right away. Um, and also don't overthink things. Don't think too much. You know, and there are always gonna be people who complain, that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I guess I that's, think that's, that's really, really good advice. I wish I had learned that way earlier in my life. <laughs> because we tend to care too much about what people think. So thank you. You finished those just a little bit over time, but that's perfect. We really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise and your lived experience with us today. Um, and we hope um, that people will use your resource, will volunteer with GDM. We'll have all of your links uh, available on our show notes so that more people come to you. And please go to, I think it's at uh, Global Deaf Muslim on Instagram in order to find out about those sign language classes that are starting on Monday and any other programs or events that GDM is having. And that's where you can find Undelieb because I stalked her there too. So thanks right, so, so much. Thank you so much. All right. Assalamualaikum. This episode is brought to you by Guidance Residential, whose fall refinance special is finally here. Not only can you unlock a lower rate to save thousands of dollars over the course of your contract to own your home sooner, you can also receive $500 towards your appraisal fee. Visit Guidance Residential on Facebook or at Guidance Residential on Instagram today.